Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, a good day to all of you. How are you doing this morning? Welcome to China Talk. My name is Wang Guan with China Media Group. So good to see all of you here. Ten years ago, it was known as the project of the century. Now, ten years since the Belt and Road Initiative was launched, it is the world's largest international and intercontinental undertaking. It has witnessed thousands of projects coming into fruition. Now, in the course of one decade, more than one trillion dollars, one trillion has been invested in these projects. But bear in mind, the BRI was not the first attempt to connect the East and the West. Along the ancient Silk Route, people, goods, and ideas traveled across deserts, mountains, and the vast steppes of Central Asia for millennia. Cultures and civilizations learned from one another, giving rise to great prosperity and social advancement for people along the route. Now today, the BRI is writing a new chapter for that same wisdom of connectivity, openness, and mutual benefit. It is not only building a bridge between the East and the West, but also linking the North and the South, and indeed creating a world where countries, cultures, civilizations, and people are more connected, leveling up different regions so we can all benefit. Now you're watching the first ever in-person event of China Talk, co-hosted by CGTN and Renmin University of China. In today's program, we'll be looking back on how the Belt and Road was inspired by the ancient Silk Road and the Silk Road spirit, how far it has traveled in the decade's time and where it is heading. Today, we're very honored to have with us four distinguished guests with us here. They are Mr. Jumart Altorbayev, former Prime Minister of Kyrgyzstan, Charles Liu, founder of Impact Asia Innovation Capital, Zhang Jianyu, Executive Director of the BRI Grain Development Institute, Zun Ahmed Han, Research Fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. In a moment, we'll be hearing from them their personal stories about the past, present, and the future of the Belt and Road. But first, let's hear messages from Eric Soheim, former UN Deputy Secretary General, and Auntie Kiet, President of the Belt and Road Initiative Caucus for the Asia Pacific. Let's look at the big screen. The Silk Road was the most important road in world history. Starting in Xi'an, the then capital of China, silk and spices, people, but maybe most importantly, ideas, traveled between China, the Middle East, Central Asia, and Europe. Now, Belt and Road is recreating a connected world with a smart, green, high-tech one. And the relationship between China and Europe is more important than ever. Heartly welcome to China Talk First Offline event. I'm Bong Ki Kiet, President of Belt and Road Initiative Focus for Asia Pacific, hailing from Malaysia. To my understanding, ERI stands for connectivity, neutrality, and symbiosis. It has been reshaping the connectivity worldwide over the past 10 years on multiple fronts, ranging from logistic, trade, finance, nations, and the people, and more effective to benefit humanity in due course. Like this, it is good to know that China Talk is hosting an on-site event, and I hope the speakers and the audience can have the most candid face-to-face -face communication to those who China Talk. Now, ladies and gentlemen, for centuries, Central Asia linked China and Europe along the Silk Road. The region was a busy hub as goods and people from across the world passed through. The Greeks, the Persians, and the Huns, and the Mongols have all left their footprints in this region, creating a rich tapestry of cultures in Central Asia. Now, our very first speaker, Mr. Jomart Otorbayev, is a former Prime Minister of Kyrgyzstan. He will take us on the journey of history and help us rediscover the glory of the ancient Silk Road. Sir, the floor is yours. Let's give them a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jomar Tatarbaev, and I am from Central Asia. Today, I would like, in this short time, to bring into the journey through the history. We are in Central Asia quite emotional about 
old Great Silk Road because Central Asia during the time being the bridge of trade and business relationships between West and East, North and South, became in the course of four centuries the center of intellectual life on Earth. The name of the great thinkers, explorers, monks, really brought us to the world scene as a superior region. The name of Zhang Qing or Li Bai related to the Silk Road. For example, not many of you know that the great Chinese poet Li Bai was born in my country, in Kyrgyzstan, then at the age of four went back to China. At that time, Central Asia produced enormous amount of creators. The name of Al Biruni or Ibn Sina, there was a really great discoveries in geography, astronomy, philosophy, poetry, uh, pharmacology, medicine, theology, and many other places. And the reason why those thinkers were lived in Central Asia is that it was not only the link between economic powers, not only generating trade, but exchange of ideas between East, West, North, and South. That is why 10 years ago, in September 2013, we as Central Asians were really excited when President Xi Jinping made his speech in Central Asia about Belt and Road Initiative. So we're thinking, why don't we repeat story of the Great Silk Road in the Middle Ages? Being the bridge, transforming ourselves from landlocked to land-connected area. During these 10 years, a lot of things were achieved. More than 150 countries and more than 30 international organizations joined this initiative. I can't say for many hours about achievements, but I only will tell you about one thing, about so-called Eurasian Rail Revolution. In May 2011, when the first train left Chongqing with the direction of Duisburg and Germany, many consider this step as a joke, not anymore. Last year, 16,000 trains, fully load trains, left Europe and China travel to both directions, which means two trains per hour. All of them, most of them, moved through Central Asia. So this is restoration, in fact, old of old Silk Road. And now we see another development in the direction. We decided between China, Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan to build a railroad through our territory, which will be shortened for another 900 kilometers a distance between uh, east and west. So it will be enormous development in exploring the straight route, which will bring more, more fruits to my region which would become again in the new digital age, the hub of trade, investment, and exchange of ideas. What to expect for the next 10 years? I think that the good start of a new development in terms of involvement of my region of Central Asia was summit in Xi'an, which President Xi Jinping greet five presidents of Central Asia, and they decided to put ahead extremely ambitious agenda of cooperation. This is, will be a good start of bringing my region back to good old times when the region was center of exchange of different ideas, trade, and creativities. What to expect in the next 10 years? Many talk about infrastructure, construction, energy, uh, communication. I will tell you about 
exchange of ideas, digitalization of Great Silk Road. I don't know why we can't create in Asia our own Silicon Valley, when we can pull all talents around the world to create new things. We are in Central Asia, have highly educated population, and we, we were inspired by new direction of China's development in modernization and high quality development. We must work together to pull talents from all our countries together to generate new product, new discoveries, inventions of 21st century. I don't see the reason why we should not generate more Nobel Prize laureates. Only then we will be successful in that century. Silk Road in the next 10 years will jump from quantity, which already quite impressive, to quality, concentration of knowledge, of brains become more and more important. So I think that the especially young generation should be focusing on digital age, on how to pioneering new discoveries, new inventions, how to bring our region, Asia, all world together with leading Asia as a leading force of the 21st century. And I wish to all of you, especially to young people, to be ambitious, to took very important and very high level tasks and work hard to achieve this goal together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now many thanks, Prime Minister Atarbayev. After 10 years of development, the Belt and Road Initiative has become the world's foremost infrastructure platform, connecting parties in need with parties with the means. But as these projects transform lives on the ground, the BRI has run into some headwinds, especially in the Western media coverage. Our next speaker, Mr. Charles Liu, knows a thing or two about the Western media. He's the founder of Impact Asia Innovation Capital. He has worked at the forefront of many of these BRI projects for many years on end. He will bring up to speed with the full picture of the BRI and address the myths and the facts of this endeavor. Charles, the floor is yours. Please welcome. Hello and welcome to China Talk. My name is Charles Liu, born in Taipei, educated in the US. I've been working in the investment sector in China for the last 30 years, which is a long time. It was 10 years ago when the Chinese government announced the launching of the major program called the Belt and Road Initiative. When I first heard of the proposal, I thought it sounded very impressive, but at the same time, it sounded almost like an idealistic slogan. There is no doubt that many of those who heard about the plan wondered whether or not this was feasible. What happened in fact, however, was the overwhelming enthusiasm of many countries to join the initiative. More than 150 countries became part of the program. And even at the very outset, hundreds and hundreds of projects were put into operation. It is obvious judging by the response of all those who have joined, that the initiative fitted well with the developmental needs and objectives of the countries involved. Now, a decade later, it's time to assess whether or not there are new needs to be addressed for the participating countries. To start with, phase one of BRI, which I call BRI 1.0, was based on infrastructure building and trade facilitation. At this point, I'd like to recall an expression used at the beginning of China's opening up and reform in the late 1970s that was, Yao zhi fu, xian xiu lu. To gain wealth, you have to build a road first. Here, to gain wealth means value creation, and to build a road first means building infrastructure first. In the same line of thought, through more than 3,000 projects, 
Roads, rail, bridges have been built along the Belt and Road countries in the past 10 years. As part of the program, there were numerous firsts. For example, the first railway tunnel in the history of Uzbekistan, the first ocean-spanning bridge in the Maldives, the first high-speed highway in Jamaica and Uganda, the first modern railway in Kenya that connects Nairobi and Mombasa. I remember that before the railway was built, it took 10 hours to get there, but now the time has been cut by more than half. None of these were easy undertakings. So now on to version 2.0 of BRI. This is something that Prime Minister had referred to as well. In my view, BRA involves accelerated industrialization, enhanced modernization, including digital economy, and further regional integration of the economies of the Belt and Road countries in terms of markets, movements of people, and manufacturing. And in this process, significantly enhance efficiency in the value creation capabilities of these countries. It's an upgrade from BRI 1.0 designed to bring greater prosperity for participating countries in a greener and more sustainable manner. Despite the successes and the enthusiasm with which the participants of BRI are embracing the future phase of its development, there has been lots of negative Western press and smearing of the initiative. There is talk of economic coercion. There is talk of debt trap. I must say it is amazing that such talk can even take place do you mean to tell me that developing countries need to be coerced to have new ports built, to have new airports built, to have new roads built, to have power stations put into place, to have telecommunication systems put in? As an African government official told me when he was approached by a senior US official on criticizing China's Belt and Road Initiative, his answer was, the airport you landed in was built by China. The highway you're traveling on right now is built by China, and the hotel you're about to check into was built by China. He said to me, we were certainly not coerced into accepting it. If it is, we would love to be coerced by China to have more built. My recent experiences of working with some Belt and Road countries and projects show that each country is distinct in its objectives, it seeks, and its specific conditions. As long as there's mutual respect and mutual understanding, it's not difficult to create the conditions for win-win collaboration. On a side note, recently at the G20 summit, US, India, Middle East, and EU have proposed to support and help Saudi Arabia build a high-speed rail to India to further enhance regional collaboration. That, to me, is quite interesting, whether or not it will take place because U.S. has not built a major rail line for more than half a century. India has not built a railroad, new railroad for more than a century. So who will actually build it? We will see. My Saudi friends say that uh, eventually the project may end up being funded by the Middle Eastern countries and built by Chinese construction companies. That would be quite interesting. For China, it would benefit significantly from greater prosperity in its neighboring countries, whereby there will be enhanced stability and good neighborly relations. Given the massive projects that have already been undertaken in China successfully, the Chinese construction companies have the expertise and experience to succeed in building infrastructure. It also benefited economically from having such contracts executed and be rewarded for its work. Given the sheer size and scale of projects in China and what China has done in developing countries, the economies of scale really kicks in and allow projects to be executed with the highest efficiency and the lowest cost, which of course benefits both sides. This has been done and indeed continues today after the first decade of the initiative. Is the Build and Road Initiative yet another slogan? I think by now, you, me, and everyone involved have already got an answer. It's been fantastic. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Charles. We learned a lot. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That was Charles Liu. Now, if you ask people which color captures the essence of the Belt and Road Initiative, many would tell you that it would be color green. About seven years ago, Chinese President Xi Jinping first proposed building a green Belt and Road Initiative with partners. Since then, great progress has been made in making the BRI green. A recent report shows that 2023 is on track to be the greenest year for the BRI since its inception. Our next speaker, Mr. Zhang Jianyu, is the executive director of the BRI Green Development Institute, who will tell us how the BRI is going green. Let's welcome. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our China Talk. My name is Zhang Jianyu. I'm the executive director of the Green BRI Institute and also part of the BRI International Green Development Coalition. When President Xi first announced that China wants to build a green Silk Road, the whole world was not fully convinced. They think they probably, this is just some talk by the Chinese leader as part of his effort to advocate Silk Road. Well, when President Xi announced again during the second BRI summit that he wants green to be the background color of BRI, and he, China wants to build a green BRI, well, the world was semi-convinced because they have seen the good progress China has really made. Well, I was recently in, nah, in Kenya and personally witnessed how green the China's infrastructure project can become. This is the uh, Mombasa to Nairobi uh, railroad. Not only the project itself was built to the high standards, but also the project is really trying to integrate all different kinds of environmental measures. So as not only a be itself becomes a low carbon solution for the transportation system for Kenya, but also as a great solution to help protect the local biodiversity and endangered species. A special corridor for the elephant was built, what I call the soft solution, the how to manage and how to train the train drivers and how to install monitors to make sure that when the elephants, because the elephants, they don't really listen to you, they don't really go through the corridors you, you prepare for them. They want to go with their own way. But how to make sure you know, additional measures was, was put into place so as to protect the element. Actually, when I was there, I discovered that in the 2019 national reporting by the Kenya government to the United Nations Climate Secretary, they actually listed the Mombasa to Nairobi solution as one of the great low carbon contributions the country has made to the global climate movement. So that was really great. Well, Chinese government didn't stop at just talk the talk, but also they really walked the walk. A whole series of policies and measures has been put into place to green the infrastructure projects China is putting forward overseas. Two things are really important. First, they changed the management of the environment from ad hoc mood to, to integrate the environmental requirements into the whole process of the project management for all the overseas investment. Secondly, they changed the originally what they call the sovereign principle that you need to only to comply with the local environmental standards and regulations to all the Chinese overseas investment need to not only meet with the local requirements but also Chinese standards and in the absence of Chinese standards, the international standards. The other part that China has really made the great contribution following President Xi's pledge in helping developing countries to build low carbon and green energy systems is that from 2021, that was the first year in China's overseas investment in energy projects, green energy projects has surpassed that of those fossil fuel projects. And when President Xi made the announcement, not a single coal-fired power plant was built 
in China's overseas investment. Well, if we really want to beef up all our renewables, uh, sustainable development, environmental projects in the Belt Road countries, there are both challenges and also solutions. And I list three of them. The first one is you really need to have a technical solution for your problems. You need to have a cheap, reliable, and accountable solution, i.e. the solar panels, the wind farms, and all the uh, environmental cleanup technologies. Well, China has made the greatest contribution in that area because through China's effort, the reliable, high-quality, efficient manufacturing effort of China, China has lowered the cost by 87% for the solar panels in the world. The second, you need finance. Well, from uh, 2022, that in China's overseas energy investment, green has started to account a large portion, almost the majority of the energy investment projects. And also China is trying to share with the world its experience in developing particular the decentralized solutions for the energy systems as part of its effort to the world. And certainly you need policy. You need a good policy to reduce the subsidy, subsidies. You need good policy to integrate all kinds of economic and social policies so as you can develop clean energy system. China is also sharing with the world, with the journey itself has gone through for the past 10 years, how to take care of those policies. Last but not the least, actually, if you really want to develop that, you need global cooperation. I'm act actually very happy to see the whole world is trying to follow up. Europeans have their global uh, gateway project, US has the B3W, and they're all trying to uh, you know, put their part into this. But unfortunately, there's not a global good cooperation of all the different efforts together. And that's really something that we need. Well, as the report has said, the first six months has been the greenest six months of China's overseas investment for the past 10 years during the journey of the BRI development. I look forward, this 2023 could become the greenest year for the Chinese overseas investment during the BRI journey. And I think we want green to be the background color for the BRI development. We want to develop a green BRI. But also China is making all its effort through this endeavor to contribute to the 2030 Global Sustainable Development Goals, all 17 of them, about 50% of that is linked to the efforts of the BRI. I think by all means, we should all team up together with the global effort to support and encourage and China to do more to further green the BRI, without which we'll not be able to have as our SDGs achieved, without which we would probably not be able to achieve our climate security as the whole world is aspiring to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Director Zhang, thank you. Now our next speaker is not that uh, much older than many of you here, sitting here. She's a young scholar, a resident scholar at neighboring Tsinghua University. She's also a scholar with Center for China and Globalization. And she will be talking about a very important subject that is youth exchange and people-to-people -people exchange. Because as the BRI embarks on the journey into its second decade, it is to this youth that will benefit the most from an interconnected world. So what is the future of the BRI and what will it bring for the younger generation? Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Zhu Ahmad Khan. She's from Pakistan. She here. She will be sharing with us her personal stories traveling alongside the Bowden Road from her hometown to China. Let's welcome. Thank you, Wang Guan. Let's start dramatically. My name is Zun Ahmed Khan. I am 25 years old, and 10 years from now, I will be one of the leading voices in security studies from my region. Well, that was eight years ago. And these are the words with which I started my application at Tsinghua University. 
This was my personal statement. And what it says to me, even today, is that I was as sure as my name and how old I am that I want to be in Beijing. So how did it all start? My father was flying with Pakistan International Airlines through the 80s and 90s to Beijing. So I had his photographs, his stories, um, his experiences and adventures growing up with me. And we also still have some beautiful artifacts, Chinese artifacts in our drawing room. And I was, of course, always drawn to them. However, the truth is this is not what brought me to China. What brought me was the period between 2007, 8 up until 2014. This was a period when people like me, people who looked like us, were seen as a problem. Most of the narratives that were dominant, that were telling us how to be, how to think, what to study, what to believe, were coming from the global north. It was during my first job as an international relations or regional security expert that I started coming across more developments from Beijing. The Shanghai Corporation Organization and the Shanghai Spirit, gosh, that resonates much more than wars on terror. Wars never worked. Our people were casualties in those wars. Don't we need a different mindset? And then I read about the Belt and Road Initiative, at that time, the One Belt, One Road, that sounds like something we need. We need trade, not aid. When I was reading more developments from China, these, these different, this shifting mindset, I thought it's most likely that the country that can lead us speedily towards a multipolar world is China. This is why I came to Beijing. And then I landed in Xinhua, very luckily. It was a program, Chinese politics and foreign policy, and it was a dream come true. So I came to Beijing in August 2015 for the first time, and it was in April 2015 that the first phase of infrastructure projects in Pakistan was announced. $46 billion of energy infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, special economic zones, the port of Gwadar that we in Pakistan had been envisioning about developing for decades. All of that was happening. China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPEC, remains the first and the last thing, the, the center of any conversation in Pakistan that is about development. Also, we saw that it was not just about hard infrastructure, ports, pipelines, roads, railways. We were talking about changing human lives, impacting people. And I saw a lot of that. This school that you can see right in front of you, this is still the best school in Balochistan. It was built by the company that was working in Gwadar. They're still developing the port there. But they invested in the best school to improve opportunities for girls' educations. There are other agriculture projects, ways to make ordinary farmers more empowered, fishermen, uh, women in China, uh, in Chinese companies working in Pakistan have opportunities that women in those regions in Pakistan couldn't have fathomed. So these are the human changes, the changes in mindset that are currently happening and have been happening step by step since 2015, 16 and onwards. Even the conversation on development has changed. Before, we used to think poverty alleviation is about stipends and funds and basically just draining your tax. But it's not, is it? It's about opportunity creation, creativity, about realizing that people that aren't better off today have solutions. So how does all of that connect with my life in China? The things I've observed and seen have, have been have changed me the way I think. And I'd like to share a few examples. I went in to Huaping in 2021. And we knew that Huaping recently was under poverty, and it had recently come out of poverty. It was a village. So we were expecting slight development, nothing, nothing amazing. But can you believe that when we drove into Huaping, it was a city. It was almost as good as my city, which is the second biggest city in Pakistan in terms of infrastructure. The Chinese crew with me was equally baffled to see, wow, we were not expecting this. It was energizing, dynamic, people were laughing. It was, it was an amazing space to be, all in a span of four to five years. So we asked our host, how was it possible? He said, mangoes. Oh, we grow mangoes in Pakistan too. 
So at the end of that conversation, what we all concluded is that poverty alleviation is multifaceted, number one. It means infrastructure, it means better education, creativity, value addition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's not that simple, but it's possible. And number two, it also means that ordinary people are not just viewing the world. They're not just observers. They're not a burden. They are the real solution. It was the people of Huaping, and it is the people of countless villages and countless cities of China that have made betterment possible. And when you see these developments up close, I've been to more than 25 provinces and regions, if I'm counting correctly, um, and I've seen that every city, every county, you go and meet the locals and they so proudly talk about how they made it happen. It's really the right policies and people coming together to create synergy. And so 800 million people is such a big number. And another factor is that we talk about the Belt and Road, we talk about also diversity, acceptance for different civilizations. What I really felt, an epiphany, if you could say, about these travels in China came. China is so diverse. Also, 1.4 billion people. There's so many different cultures, you know, histories, and everyone is so proud of their hometown. So when you look at China, when you really understand this country, then you realize it is the story of 1.4 billion people with different perspectives even creating synergy. And it is an example for continents and countries across the world to realize that we don't need uniformity. That's a false notion. We need unity. Sometimes I think, you know, we always talk about these challenging times and how polarized the world is, the new Cold War, et cetera, et cetera. What I see is that 20 years ago, people could only have dreamt of a world where people of the global south, the so-called silent majority that was irrelevant, the 80%, could actually come together, exchange views, understand each other, relate. They actually felt empowered. And that is the world we are living in today. What the Belt and Road Initiative is doing is, of course, fundamental infrastructure, prerequisites to a better life, pragmatic mindset. So this generation, all of you here, you are the luckiest generation that's ever lived. I think so. You are not the future, you are the present. I've seen many people from China and abroad, once they travel, they change their views, they come back with a passion to make a difference. And you will and you can make a positive difference. Just be open-minded and understand that diversity is our strength. And lastly, I will just say this. The world is made of two kinds of people. Someone wise said this, so I'm stealing these words at best. Either cynics who say, oh, it's too challenging, it's impossible, how can we alleviate poverty? And then they just sit back and say, we can't do anything. And then there's a world of dreamers and optimists. And it's their efforts that make our world a better place. Thank you. In order to succeed globally, you have to be in China. It has come from zero to the, being the biggest IP application country in the world. BDS is a public group dedicated to the world. I was uh, absolutely struck by how that area has been uh, transformed. I spent a month traveling China, talking to ordinary people to see what they have to say about their country. I'm an observer of China a participant in China's political discourse. China has the political will from the top and the ability to mobilize grassroots officials to help the poor. The one country, two systems policy presents immense opportunities for Hong Kong. The only litmus test of democracy is whether it can generate real benefits for the people. China, the first patent law was made right before I arrived, just 30 something years ago in 1985. But China has come a long way in this regard. Seeking consensus every day, despite differences, is in Chinese people's DNA. The Chinese proactiveness in sharing the development 
dividends with the BRI partners has reshaped the landscape of transborder connectivity worldwide. China is now our largest trading partner and the UAE is China's largest non-oil trading partner in the Middle East and North Africa. It emphasizes again and again that China's door will be open wider and wider and China will keep on promoting economic globalization. Today, as you might know, China is a global leader in electricity production from renewable uh, energy source. Stepping back from your own center can help you understand that there is no culture better than another. So the idea of He really involves respecting, in fact, loving diversity, appreciating diversity, but on a kind of foundation of peaceful order. My name is Daniel Bell. I am Yi Muyin. Liu Meng. Simon Lichtenberg. I'm Shen Jin. Li Xin. Carrie Lam. Minor Chang'an. Leslie Master of Fire. David Ferguson. Ong Ti Kiet. Wang Yiwei. Wang Hui Yao. Mali Al Dahri. Victor Gao. My name is Yao Kutke. Well, welcome, welcome to China, China Talk. Okay, welcome back to this first ever on-site edition of China Talk. It is our honor and privilege to have all these four uh, distinguished guests and experts. And uh, it's, it's truly thought-provoking to hear all of you talking from your personal experiences, uh, from you know, the graining, uh, the, which is an ongoing active process of the BRI, to, of course, your personal journey throughout the way. I think. Uh, uh, I was almost in tears a couple of times. Uh, <laughs> a very, very impressive speech. I think many of you sitting down there would agree. Charles, uh, impressive as always. I think a very thorough analysis on the nuances uh, of the Western narrative. And uh, Prime Minister, of course, it's always great to have you with us and um, you know, speaking to us from the point of view of being a Kyrgyz and a Central Asian. So first of all, I would like to start by, by asking all of you to really um, describe the BRI now that we're marking its 10th anniversary in uh, one word. Um, which word would encapsulate the spirit of the BRI, in your opinion, Prime Minister? Connectivity. Do you mind elaborating? Connectivity. All right. It's just one word. One word. Well, that's exactly the word that I was thinking <laughs> of. No. Well. Think of another, Charles. Uh, you can do that. Development. Um, Dynamism. Not going to be graining, right? <laughs> 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 well, that would be word. boring. <laughs> Actually, I, I always been thinking about uh, uh, BRI could also be uh, labeled as the better relationship initiative that China is proposing to the world. So, Prime Minister Torbayev, uh, let me start with you. Talking about this hub center of not just infrastructure, bridges, roads, railways, but a hub of ideas that you kept emphasizing. Uh, can you perhaps talk to us a little bit more about that? How do you envisioning the center of ideas under the, the uh, aegis of the BRI to take place? Uh, the reason of Central Asia's blossoming in the Middle Ages weren't the camels only who drew the goods around the area, but exchange of idea between east, north, south, and west. Uh, in 21st century, ideas and talents even more important than it was all along the human history. So we, I would uh, reiterate and underline that the boiling pot of talents have to be built as soon as possible a anywhere in the world, including our continent. Diversity is our strength and should be so going forward. Charles, you've been working with investors throughout the Middle East and mm -hmm. uh, throughout the world, in fact, on some BRI projects. Um, uh, what is the latest situation regarding, f uh, number one, the value creation of these projects? I can cite a very simple example, and I think this is a very good story. A senior OAU, Organization of African Unity, official said to me, the booming of Africa in the last decade should really attribute itself 
to thanking Shenzhen. And I said, Shenzhen, why? He said, Shenzhen is where the companies are that put in the digital infrastructure for communication. Mm. And Shenzhen has the supply chain to be able to make $45 cell phones, which means everybody can afford a cell phone. This is where connectivity comes in. Because, for example, before these things were built, over 90% of the people in Africa didn't have banking. Yeah. No banks. But with mobile communication, digital banking, information flow, connectivity, not only social connectivity, but also education, and so on and so forth, has made a massive change to this pace of change of Africa. And this is part of the Belt and Road effort. This is where communication is just one piece of infrastructure being built, and how phenomenal the change has been made to places like Africa. So I think, of course, Huawei and ZTE, who built in, put in the infrastructure systems, made money. They were doing fine. And also the cell phone manufacturers also were doing fine, because Africa now has about a billion people also. If you include North Africa, it's over a billion people. Significant market. So I think all sides benefited from the effort in the process. So this is why, you know, my African friends, when you talk about China, they think about Shenzhen. Soon, unity without uniformity. Yeah. And you're confident that it could be happening along the BRI, and especially between China and Pakistan, yeah. now that we're entering, what, CPAC 2.0? There is no question about copying the China model. Never has China said, copy our model or anything, any model is universally applicable. This is also what many developing countries are sick of. Instead, China's own demonstration through domestic development is creativity, critical thinking, studying yourself. And I think, you know, that is a big factor why China is not moralistic. It is not about uniformity. Uniformity is impossible. It is about having the same goal and helping Pakistan maybe, okay, this is what ha worked for us. This is what worked in X, Y, Z. You need to find a creative solution that is relevant to your domestic circumstances. So I think it is happening. It's always been the reality. But once more of us accept it, we will be working towards a common goal. I want to add one thing um, my colleague said about <coughs> China is prepared to help. Belt and Road Initiative is not about help or assistance. It's invitation for cooperation. When people asking me, do you need help? I said, we don't need help. We need cooperation. We need equal approach towards projects which be launched. And this is a big problem with developing countries who is looking for BRI as free assistance, free money, free services. This world will be successful when everyone will be competitive. Nobody asking for money, for services, whatever. Equal approach, and this is, must be explained to everyone. So capacity building in recipient countries again must be at the core of Belt and Road Initiative. And we're coming back to education, to educating all around the world what it really means. Charles, do you also agree that um, compared to conventional colonial powers, uh, there is a, a lack of uh, chauvinism, uh, uh, imperialism mentality um, from the Chinese initiatives. I, I think uh, if you look at the BRI and when it was launched, it was interesting. Ten years ago, what was happening ten years ago was very interesting. After the great financial crisis of 2008, China launched a four trillion RMB infrastructure program to build and actually help a lot of countries get out of the financial crisis. Yeah. So I think from day one, the Chinese perspective has been, 
let's get wealthy together. Let's create value together. It was not meant to be a dominating force in these countries. Great. Director Zhang, uh, let me turn to you. Talking about the graining of the BRI, uh, obviously we're not there yet um, because uh, what over 50% of the existing projects of the BRI, especially in construction, uh, are predominantly relying on fossil fuel. Uh, so the greening of the BRI is very important, right? Capturing uh, carbon, uh, reducing pollution to the environment. Uh, uh, tell us which stage are, are we at when we talk about the greening of the BRI? I think we are making uh, two sets of efforts. The first ad set of efforts is we're really trying to uh, step up our uh, requirements and process management for the uh, BRI related, infra particularly the infrastructure project. So by itself, we are uh, on the one side uh, reducing pollution, uh, improving their uh, efficiency, and also trying to really bring a harmony of you know, the project itself with nature. So process management and also stepping up the requirement for those non-energy related projects. And energy related projects start to account uh, an increasing uh, share of, of the overseas investment that China is putting forward uh, in the BRI countries, uh, particularly for uh, in starting from uh, 2022. And uh, uh, in those projects uh, that the really the pure green is, uh, is being fully embodied uh, in those projects, uh, solar, wind, uh, and also, you know, many of those new innovative concepts. One new terminology has picked up uh, for the first half of the year is called the Xin San Yang. So in China's overseas exporting effort, uh, solar panels, batteries, and EVs start to uh, uh, really become a dominant uh, portion of our uh, exporting uh, effort. So I think this definitely is, is a long uh, process that we're going through. But I really want to emphasize, if we really believe in what the UNEP, United Nations Environment Program, has been telling us that the human being as a society we're facing the triple crisis, climate change, uh, environmental pollution, and also depletion of the uh, ecological diversity resources that we're facing. No effort, no effort is, is not enough you know, to really uh, gather the global effort to do this. And I, I think China is really trying to do a good example, be a good global citizen, uh, while doing all the other things, you know, really putting green as the center, be green being the background color. I just hope all the other nations, you know, they're not just talk the talk, but actually also walk the walk, and uh, you know, trying to uh, not necessarily follow China's example, but really trying to cooperate with China's very sincere effort to deal with this triple crisis together. Very good, very good. Thank you so much for all our panelists. I understand we have some questions from you guys, uh, young aspiring students here at Jianmin University. This event is the first on-site event of China Talk presented to you by CGTN and Jianmin University. So we'll open it up right now, right here. Um, if you have any questions, please identify your name and raise your hand. Look at that lady in the front row. Thank you. My name is Basma from Syria. I want to ask Mr. Zhang, how uh, does China finance the PRI and how has China benefited from PRI? Thank you. Well, I went to COP27 in Sham Sharik, uh, in Egypt, and the big word came out of the Sham Sharik is that for the developing world, you be able to meet with the uh, 1.5 degree pathway from the Paris Agreement, the ballpark number is $2 trillion per year by 2030. And only $1 trillion can come from you know, MDB, sovereign funds, and all the government support. But the other one, the other half really needs to come from the private sector. And, but if you look at the IMF report, it will give you a daunting uh, disappointing picture because it tells that currently the MDBs, their multiplier is only about by average 1.2, which means every dollar they invest into the developing countries, they can only mobilize about 1.2 dollar uh, from the private sector. That's far from the goals that we need to achieve. Well, I think the place where China can contribute here is by looking at the domestic financing model that China has gone through for the past 10 years. I listed some of the achievements China has really made. I think China has a big capacity to serve as what we call the coordinate creditor, that lining up from the, the, uh, uh, the, the grant, from the policy uh, bank like the Import-Export Bank, to commercial bank, the Big Four Bank of China, Industrialization Bank, to direct investment, and to equity investment, to all kinds of financial instruments. Actually, 
if you look at the BRI investment by 2022, the most recent report tells us that to answer also to the prime minister's question, 61% is actually investment. So the balance has already been shifted you know, to be a more coordinated, you know, you win, I win situation by investment rather than to purely by the grant and, and, the, uh, and, and the loans. So I think that's really what China is trying to do. Yes. Gentleman from the back, uh, he raised his hand first. Thank you so much uh, to our panelists. I'm from Africa. So we're talking about 10 good years of BRR. What has been done to ensure that the people of Africa understand the true nature of the BRR? I, I told about uh, all countries around the world. Africa is not exception. The, the same recommendation I would give to uh, your countries. So you need uh, to educate your people, as, and especially decision makers, to take responsible decisions yeah, on cooperation, on cooperation, understanding deeply what Belt and Road does really means. You can subscribe that you want to join, but when things come to the practicality, when your government was asked either you want one project or another, China will listen and to what you need. So demand have to be given and sovereign debt guarant uh, uh, management system. Time for one last question, uh, that lady. May I have a question for Mr. Charles Liu? <laughs> Thank you. So um, as we all know that over the past 10 years, the BRA has made great achievements. But however, some people are saying that, um, are accusing China for trying to influence other countries, maybe like exporting its, um, its views and values. So I wonder what's your point and what's your stand on this question, on, on this issue? Thank you. Thank you. Exporting China's values, exporting China's views, exporting China's systems. What's wrong with that? What's China's values? Stability, peace, energy, make effort, improving lives of its people. What's wrong with that? And that's what China has been bringing to BRI countries, showing how poverty can be alleviated, showing how the Chinese system has actually worked to bring what well, one example is 30 years ago, the GDP per capita of India and China were exactly the same. In fact, India was $1 more than China. Mm -hmm. Today, China is five times, 500% of India. So the government has done something right. The government has delivered for its people, has alleviated poverty. So what's wrong with that? What's wrong with creating stability? What's, hap what's wrong with creating peaceful neighboring relationships of collaboration and mutual respect. So I think some Western press, they can talk all they want, but I think for most countries, most people, it's very clear what the Chinese government has done and its people and its companies. We're coming to the end of this edition, the first on-site edition of China Talk. I want to thank all of our panelists here. Thank you so very much, and also I want to thank on behalf of the organizer, CGTN, the University, for all of your attendance here today, thank you so much. I'll see you again next time, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was excellent. Very, very practical tips. Thank you, as always.